John chapter 10. Good to have everybody here tonight. Good for you folks to be online. Um, God is good all the time. Let me hear you say amen. Amen. Um, Michael is delayed in Kenya. Uh, we're not sure how long uh, something has come up and he is working on it. It's not something bad, uh, something good. And uh, so just keep him in your prayers and lift him up if you would, please. Uh, pray for those that are sick. We have our prayer request list tonight. I uh, appreciate y'all praying for me. I've actually, um, I, I have days where it's probably good that I don't, I don't know, I don't know what happens. It just, I just cannot, I just can't talk. It's not that I'm mute. It's, I, I, I don't know what to call it. But there's been many a time where I uh, went to sit down like up there or the little studio I have at home to record a watchman. And I would sit there staring at that camera for 30 minutes and going... I had no idea. And I got the script right in front of me. But it just, nothing, nothing comes out. Just, and it just have those days. And yesterday was one of those days. So I appreciate everybody praying for me. And uh, appreciate the encouragement. Uh, it bothers me, is what it does. Um, now's not the time to be silent. Is the way I see it. The way I see this world and how it is, now's not the time to be silent. But God has a reason for everything. That's what I've learned. And there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. And so I just put my trust in the Lord. And um, he always blesses. He's always good to us no matter what. And um, so Lord bless all of you uh, who prayed and uh, just helped me along yesterday, and I prayed for you. Had some good conversations on the phone today. A guy uh, that I've talked to before, a um, man from England. Um, I, I'll, go ahead and, I'll go ahead and tell you, he's, he's the gentleman that called me here a while back, and he admitted that God had brought him out of a life, a lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? A lifestyle. God had brought him out of that. And I asked him, he called and I asked him, I said, well, how have, how have you been doing since we last talked? He said, I've been doing really well. And I said, I've had you on my heart just about every day. I've prayed for you. I've got, our church has prayed for you. You've got people all over the world that have prayed for you. And uh, he just really, he, it was just a joy to speak to him. Um, he called to let me know that he found one of our hymn books online. Apparently a church, a Free Will Baptist Church in Nashville was, I don't know if it was closing down or what, but they were selling all their hymn books. And it's the Rejoice hymnal that we use. So I didn't ask him where he found it from, but you might want to, if those of you who want one of those hymn books, uh, we, can't, we can't send you one of ours. We, we have to keep them here. Um, but if you would like to uh, maybe look into seeing where he got that from, I don't know where he got it from, but maybe they still have, if they're selling the whole church full of hymn books, they probably got some left. So uh, maybe you can look for that online, Google it. Maybe it's on Facebook. Maybe that's where he found it. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, had a good conversation with him. And uh, I told him I would pray for him and did. And uh, it was just a, it was a blessing to talk to him. Just a blessing to talk to him. So John chapter 10, um, we, 
we talked about last Wednesday night how that n nobody is able to pluck us out of God's hand. And we tried to give biblical understanding of what that meant. The fact that our name is written in God's book of life. And that book, I believe, is one of the things represented by the book that is held in God's right hand, sealed with seven seals. Because the Bible says that we are sealed unto that day of redemption. The Holy Ghost has sealed us. It's just like um, we have one of those, uh, you, they used to call them seal meals I don't know what they call them now, but the vacuum sealers. And if you kill a deer, that's the best thing in the world to have. If you're going to save your own meat, kill that deer and cut it up however you want to. And it vacuum, vacuums all the air out and seals it. And you just throw it in the fridge and you don't have to worry about it for a while. Well, God has sealed us, I believe, unto the day of redemption. And um, so anyway, that's our, since our name is written in that book, that is why no man is able to pluck us out of God's hand. Number one, nobody's even worthy to take that book out of God's hand except for Jesus Christ. And I just want to reiterate to you, don't let, if, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt from God's word that you are saved and born again, don't let anybody stupidly online tell you that you're not because you've done this or you've done that. I get sick and tired of people inventing sins and, and whatever it is that you're doing, they invent a sin that they don't do or pretend they don't do lay it against your charge and then tell you you're not saved if you do things like this. And Roy, I had a guy, he accused me and Pastor Jason Cooley of being false teachers and false prophets for one reason. It's because we display an American flag here in our church. And he accused us of the sin of what, what he called statism. And I'm going, excuse me, I was born in America. I didn't ask to be born in America. It was God's choice that I be born here. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. This is my nation. These are my people. And I will be an American until the day I die. Amen. And my heart and my soul and my ministry is for America first, my own people. The fact that God has carried it around the world, and which is why I, I don't mind uh, displaying these publicly, given to me by the good people of Samburu, giving me the uh, position of eldership among their people, this denotes to them that I can, I can speak to them. I have a right to speak to them, and they have a right, they have the obligation to at least hear me out, is what this represents. And that to me is a great honor to be held. And I, like, if you remember, when I came back with this and told y'all what it meant, I was bawling like a baby because of, of God bestowing that. But I'm an American first. And I, and I know my country doesn't do everything right, especially, especially when they have someone up for Supreme Court justice who doesn't call women mothers, it calls them birthing people. Or something like that. She has memorized all 28 
new pronouns to call people and does not recognize gender. We don't want somebody like that on the court. But it's still my country. And I'm going to do everything I can to preach the gospel to this country. Somebody say amen. But they invent sins that they know they're not guilty of and they, they put it on your shoulders and say, you're not going to heaven, you're not saved because you do this. I, I would like to see that guy's, um, I'd like to see that guy's web browsing records for the past month. Know what I'm saying? Guarantee you. So anyway, no man is able to pluck them out of, out of God's hand. Now, um, let's see here. Where did I want to end up at? Yeah, 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 yeah. Re Revelation, I think I stopped here, Revelation 20. Go there, and I'm going to pick it up from there and move on. Revelation chapter 20. This is referred to as the great white throne judgment. The, it is the final judgment of those who have not already participated in the first resurrection. The first resurrection, it belongs to the saints of God, past, present, and future. That's the first resurrection. The second resurrection is referred to as the resurrection of the, the dead or the resurrection of the damned. And... Um, if, if you look in verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Go ahead and build your bunker. Go ahead and build it, you know, 10 stories deep underground. Get enough food and water and things to do with the rest of your life and try to live under there, I guarantee you God's going to pluck you out of that thing and he's going to judge you. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. We talked about that, which is the books of their deeds. And another book was open, which is the book of life. This is the book that... I believe God holds in his right hand. That book is, also represents other things, but among them it is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, again, some people say, see, Mike, the book of Revelation is not for us because in the book of Revelation people are judged and they're saved by their works. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't imply that. It doesn't even hint at that. If you are lost, you are going to be judged by the things that you did. When you are saved, God takes the book with your name on it and he covers all of your sins and transgressions with the blood of Jesus Christ so that the record of your sins has now been wiped away and you are justified. And I heard preachers say that means just as if I'd never sinned. And that is exactly what it means. Hallelujah. All sins are gone and they have been covered and blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ so that when that book is open with your name on it and God says, what is he charged with? The angel says, uh, Father God, there is no sins to be held against him. They have all been covered by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Woo! Amen. But then, um, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Just as there is a second birth, those who are born again, there is a second death. Pat Boone sang a song years ago called Everybody Dies. Beautiful song. And the lyrics go, uh, see if I can remember it right. Uh, born once, die twice. Born twice, just die once. Amen? Does that make sense to you? Okay? And that's how it is. The second death is an everlasting state of death. You have been committed to God's prison, which is the lake of fire, and you are consciously aware of your place, your position, the flames around you, the torture and the torment that you are under, you are knowledgeable of that torment forever and forever. And uh, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And again, I want to stress to you, I didn't really understand this. I heard preachers preach it uh, all my life when I was growing up in church. That church membership does not mean you, that, you're, that you're going to heaven. And, you know, this being really the only church I ever went to, I, didn't, I couldn't understand that there were people that actually believed that. But there are. I remember there was a, a girl that I went to school with, high school with, and uh, she was a really cute girl, and I wanted her to like me. She said she went to church, and then I'm going, oh, I really want her to like me. We were in drama together, and we were practicing a play, and she came in for the practice late, and the uh, the play director asked her where she was, and she said, I was at catechism school. She wasn't Catholic. She was Lutheran. And I, had to, I didn't know what catechism school was. And so I asked her, what is catechism school? And basically, they teach her the doctrines of the church. She memorizes the answers to questions. When she can recite the catechism, they then baptize her, and then they write her name down in the membership role of that church, and they say, you are now born again. And I'm just going, uh, it doesn't work that way. And all of a sudden, didn't matter how pretty she was, I didn't want anything to do with her. When we, we, I was friendly to her. We, we stayed friends. But I, did, I, didn't, I, I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to get involved in that. That's not right. Here's a person who was taught that if she passes this earthly test and her name gets written down in the church membership role, that she is born again and the church membership role transfers to heaven, and her name is in the book of life, therefore she's going to heaven. And that's not how it works. If God doesn't write your name in his book of life, you're not going. You can have religious instruction, you can pass the religious test, you can do the religious rituals, but you're not going to heaven. That is not how it works. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now turn back to John chapter 10. We're going to raise a question here that I got, boy, I got in trouble over. John chapter 10. 
So I'll ask you the question, can man become a god? Can man become a god? Now, I taught on this several years ago, and a lady heard me, and I gave the scriptures, and she said, um, I heard that you said man becomes God. I said, no, let me correct you. I said that man becomes a God, little g. And she commenced to arguing with me, and she said, well, you're, you're a blasphemer. You're, you're teaching heresy. You're, you're teaching false doctrine. And I commenced to reading to her the scripture. And she didn't want to hear it. And I don't remember the exchange back and forth. It's been so many years. But basically, she said, I am not listening to you ever again. Hung the phone up, and that was it. I couldn't tell you who she was. I don't know if she's changed her mind since then and is listening now. I don't know. But let's, let's read this and see if we can find the answer. John chapter 10, verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? In other words, I've healed people. I've raised people from the dead. Well, we haven't got into Lazarus yet, but I've healed people. I've turned water into wine. I've done marvelous things in your eyes. So for which one of these are you stoning me for? And verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou... Being a man, makest thyself, now notice in your Bible, capital G, God. So let me ask this question. Is Jesus, capital G, God? Yes. A thousand times yes. Angels bowing down before him. Kingdoms and thrones and principalities Bowing before him, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is both King of kings and Lord of lords. Somebody say amen. His name, according to Isaiah, was wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Two of those names given by Isaiah to Jesus denoted his Godheadship. He is the, the mighty God. That's uh, Brother Reg Kelly was telling this story that he had two young Mormons. He was getting in his car from some, going leaving somewhere there in town in uh, Norwood, Missouri. And he knew these young men were Mormons. And Reg is going to talk to them. He's not afraid of them. And uh, Reg is going to try to witness to them. And they started talking to him. And, and Reg said, boys, let me, let me just stop you right here. And he said, I'm going to ask you a question. And if you answer the question truthfully, I'll listen to you. And they said, okay, what's your question? And Reg said, is Jesus God Almighty? And they started sidestepping. They started talking, trying to mis mislead him, misdirect him away from that question. And Red said, you, you've not answered the question. It's a simple yes or no. Is Jesus the Almighty God? And again, they just kept sidestepping the issue. But he could see, usually in that group of two, there's one of them that really is the, 
he, he just is in charge. And his face is getting redder and redder by the minute. And Red said, still, you have not answered my question. Now I'm going to ask it one more time, then I'm going to drive off. Is Jesus almighty God? And finally, that one Mormon young man said, no! Just like that. And Red said, thank you, thank you for your honesty, for answering the question based upon what you were told. Now let me give you the scriptures that prove otherwise. And Reg let him have it with scriptures. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. And I don't know how it went from there, but he stood his ground with them. And so, is it okay for Jesus to call to make himself himself as God capital G the Bible says that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God that was and he was he was equal with God so they said that's why we want to stone you for that blasphemy now look how Jesus answered them and Take your Bible, hold your place there in John 10, and take your Bible and turn to Psalm, um, 89, I think it is. Or Psalm, let's see here. Psalm 82, maybe. Yeah, Psalm 82. And hold your place there. John chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. With a little g. So now Jesus says, if he, meaning God, called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Underline that phrase in your Bible. The scripture cannot be broken. Name something else in the Bible that cannot be broken. Huh? Well, that can be. It was broken. I'm thinking more along lines of the, the body. Not a bone of him was broken. Okay? Scripture cannot be broken. The bones of Christ could not be broken. They were not broken, even though... They went around to break the legs of the men that were on the cross, but by the time they got to Jesus, they realized he was dead, so they didn't break his legs, which fulfilled the prophecy, not a bone of him shall be broken. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. So now, look at Psalm 82. In verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, little g, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and, sh and fall like one of the princes. Now, I've used that to describe how I think these devils who go around in these lighted ships happen to crash on earth and die. But I'm going to take it in a different direction and, and apply it this way. 
when we die as born-again Christians, what did Jesus say we would be like? He said, when they asked him, okay, whose wife, the woman has married the man, he died, left no child, she had to marry his brother, she had to marry all seven of his brothers, whose wife shall, will she be in heaven? Because she left no seed. And he said, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection we shall be like the angels of heaven. Okay? And the angels of heaven are immortal. Take care of them. They are immortal beings. They do not die like mortal beings do. Okay? We die. Solomon said that there, between us and dogs and cattle, there's no difference in that we die, turn into the dust. They die and turn into the dust. So as far as that's concerned, we're no different than any of the animals of the earth. Okay? But when we as born-again saints die and are resurrected, number one, the Bible says we shall be made like unto him and his glorious body. For we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Being immortal. That makes us not false gods that are worshipped by evil men. That makes us like the angels of heaven that are immortal and cannot and do not die. Does that make sense to everybody? And then he, he says here, Ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. Now the Most High is one of God's names. In fact, I like this. The phrase Most High is found exactly 49 times in the Bible. 7 times 7. Isn't that neat? Um, the man that called me today said that he had been doing a little comparing with other Bibles and, and he said, you know, the King James writes Jehovah four times like the gospel and he said, but you also have it when it's added to other words like Jehovah Jireh, it's three more times making seven times total the name Jehovah is in the King James Bible. And I said, it just sounds right, doesn't it? He said, yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so the question is, when we die as born again saints, will we become little g gods. Yes, we will be like the angels. We will be immortal. We will be of their celestial bodies. Okay, and in that sense, we will be gods. Okay, not worshipped, not evil angels, not evil gods, not Baal, not... Um, Saturn, not the any of these, not Mars, Jupiter, not any of these other gods that have been worshipped throughout pagan history, but we will be gods just the same. Now, think about what the devil said in Genesis 3. He had an alternative way for man to become God or a God. His version was disobey what God said and eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then you shall be as gods, little g, knowing good and evil. So to me, it's amazing. God has a plan Spelled out in multiple places in the Bible, but I'll, I'll just pick one, 1 Corinthians 15, where God says, just planting our body in the ground like a seed, God's going to resurrect that body that was put in the ground 
but it's going to be of a different appearance once it rises up and it will be given a celestial body and it will be a glorified body it will be a body that will never die never sin never suffer any pain nor harm nor anything like that it will be a body like that now that's the body that I want amen and God's way is let this body die that's God's way and trust in the one who can save you Jesus Christ but the devil's version of it is disobey God eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you shall not surely die and you shall be as gods so to the lady years ago who hung the phone up on me and said well you're teaching blasphemy you're teaching heresy I, I basically explained it to her exactly the way it's written in scriptures he has said I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High the phrase sons of God in the Old Testament always applies to angels the phrase sons of God in the New Testament always applies to the Saints always brethren we are now sons of God but it does not appear what we shall be but when we shall see him we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is so even though we've been given the title it's like it's like when um, sister Helen was with child with your first born you went around saying that's mine that's right that one's mine okay it ain't like nowadays where they say oh who's the father well we've got it kind of narrowed down depends on what he looks like when he comes out that's sad isn't it you see he's already your son who was your firstborn son or daughter daughter, daughter. so she was already yours before she was even born wasn't she and once she's born she's still yours so think of it like that we haven't got the new body yet but does that make us any less the sons of God than if we were already in heaven no we are right now the children of the Most High God sons of God and if it's a son of God it's a God because God doesn't give birth to chickens somebody say amen Amen. All right. Now in verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said, I am the Son of God, the Son of God. And that's the difference. The only begotten Son of God, but not the only Son of God. That's where the new translations make one of their biggest faults is that they have taken out the phrase only begotten son of God and they've exchanged it with the one and only son of God but that's not true it's not true all of us who are born again are children of the Most High we are sons of God so he says, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works. That you may, now, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized. And there he abode. 
And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Basically means that once he said that, they murmured amongst themselves and they said, we're going to grab him, we're going to drag him out in the street, and we're going to stone the daylights out of him. And Jesus did one of those tricks again. He just walked through the crowd without anybody touching him. I, I would love to see that in a movie. A packed, thousand people packed together so tight you couldn't get, a fly couldn't get in there, and yet Jesus just walks right through them. Hey, if Moses can part the Red Sea, Jesus can part the red devils. Amen. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. Uh, Psalm 82, 6, I have said, you are gods and all of you children are the most high. Matthew 22, 30, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Exodus 18, 11, look at this. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, both good and bad. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. And look at Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight: Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Now why did he say that? Is it okay for you to hate the devil? I sure hope it is, because I hate him. I hate everything he's done. I hate everything he plans on doing. I hate him. But when he said, thou shalt not revile the gods, I believe it's talking about, number one, the good angels. Number two, those who have, are born again who in the wrecked resurrection, I think we're going to replace the third of the angels that are cast out of heaven. I think that's, I think they're in, excuse me, you're in my house. And I want you out. And take that stench with you. You stink it all up. Okay? Thou shalt not revile the gods. Joshua 22, 22, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods says it twice. He knoweth and Israel he shall know if it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, save us, save us not this day. Psalm 82, 1, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among who? The gods. And who is he talking about? The angels. Psalm 97, 7, confounded be all they that serve graven images and boast themselves of idols, worship him, all ye what? Gods. And that's, number one, the good angels, two-thirds of them. And number two, those of us born again who have been resurrected, we will spend an eternity worshiping God. Worship him, all ye gods. Psalm 97, 9, For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Now, just because we will attain to an immortal state, and just because we will be as the angels of heaven, that does not mean that we will be equal to God himself. The difference is plainly given to you in that the King James translators knew that in this case, the word gods should have a little g. Not a big, not a capital G. To denote the difference between the good angels, which are the good gods, and the mighty God, God himself, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Thou art exalted far above all gods. 1 Corinthians 8, 5. For though there be that are called gods, 
whether in heaven or in earth, as there be God's many and Lord's many. But to us there is but one God, notice the capital G, the Father of whom are all things and we in him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. One of the things very quickly that separated America at the beginning from Great Britain was this idea that all men were in fact created equal. I still say God saved the queen. I believe that England should retain its monarchy because as long as there is a monarch in England, they protect the king's Bible. Okay? And you're not supposed to curse the king anyway. But one of the things that our founding fathers were sure to do was they knew that in England there were classes of people. I met a man, he came, he, he married a, a, he was a British newspaper editor. He married a, a lady from Fenton and every now and then they would come and she would visit um, her folks. And I, he, had, uh, he had heard of me somehow, some way, and he called one of the visitors. His name was Alan Franklin. And uh, he and I did uh, a radio program together back when I was on KJSL years ago. And wonderful, godly man and loves the Bible. But he said, Mike, the class state in England is still there. And he said, you still have men with titles who are higher up than everybody else is, and those titles are hereditary. So if, if a man is a lord in England, and he has a son, that son is, will inherit his hereditary title as lord, even if he is a skunk. Think of uh, Prince Andrew. He's had his titles stripped from him by the queen herself just he was given those titles because of his birth he was to be referred to as his royal highness but because of this scandal with jeffrey epstein she has stripped him of all of his titles he cannot be called lord he cannot be called his royal highness he he has been ousted from those titles but he said that class system is still in England. And in England, they don't believe that all men are created equal. And so a judge sitting on a bench in England is not called your honor or judge. They are referred to as my Lord. They have a house of commons and a house of lords. And the House of Lords has more power than the House of Commons. And sometimes it switches back and forth throughout history. I'm not going to get into all that. But they still have dukes and lords and princes over there. And our founding fathers said, uh-uh. No man, and they wrote it in the Constitution, no man should be given any title of kingship, lordship, dukedom, or anything like that. So who can become president of the United States? Does it have to be someone who is Lord? No. It, obviously anybody can become president of the United States. And that's my point. It may not work out so well, but at least the poorest child in America can rise up through hard work and whatever, and become president of the United States of America. Not because he has it owed to him by his her heredity or whatever. He still has to be a citizen of the United States, though. 
I won't say no more about that. Okay. But anyway, we that they the cry during the Revolutionary War was no king save King Jesus. That's America. Amen.